Let's look at taking the results of a consolidation laboratory test and using it to compute the amount of consolidation and settlement that will happen in the field under some one-dimensional loading condition. So again, we'll motivate this using a steel bar. I think it's really easy to understand the steel bar and then extrapolate. So here's a picture that shows that steel bar. Um, there's some force acting on it axially. It has length L. Uh, depth is measured from the top of the bar downward, that's Z. And then displacement is delta. So if you put the load on the bar, we'll have some vertical displacement. And then the Young's modulus and cross-sectional area are E and A. All right, so we know from strength of materials, um, the axial stress is F divided by A. The axial strain, based on Hooke's law, is sigma divided by Young's modulus. So we get sigma over E. And substituting in sigma, you get F over AE. Uh, I'm just going to erase that A because it's just vertical stress. I mean, that's easy to see. All right, and then what you learn in strength of materials is that uh, the, the displacement is equal to strain times L. So you get FL over AE or PL over EA or something, you know, whatever symbols you were using back then. So what we've just done is actually integrated vertical strain over the length of the bar. I want to show you that we've actually solved that integral. So here's the integral that I'm saying that we solved, the integral from 0 to L of epsilon Z, epsilon of Z, DZ. And I'm leaving epsilon of Z as possibly being a variable. So the strain doesn't necessarily have to be constant. It could vary with depth. Um, and it does vary with depth for soil. It does not for this bar. So we substitute in the equation for epsilon Z. Uh, epsilon is just F over AE. Those are constants. You can pull them outside of the integral, and when you integrate, you just get F L over A E, because F A and E are all constants. They don't depend on depth. So for consolidation, we do the same procedure. We integrate strain with depth. Um, and what we do is to first find the strain function, and then uh, usually we discretize it into thin layers. So it turns out that there's not going to be a simple equation that we can to derive a closed form solution. And the reason for that is that the stiffness of the soil varies with depth. Um, if you recall, when we plotted, um, let's see, come up here. Got to go way up, uh, right here. So when you look at, um, say, vertical strain versus effective consolidation stress or void ratio versus effective consolidation stress, the slope of this line, that's equal to the stiffness, right? So if we want to compute the change in void ratio, we would need to integrate this A sub V over some loading increment. Well, you can see that varies a lot here. It's a lot different there than it is there. So in general, A sub V is going to vary with depth. Um, it also varies with loading condition. So this curve right here happens to be the normal consolidation line. It's easy to see it down here, right? That's the normal consolidation line. Uh, and then you could be on this unload reload line instead, right? So notice that even if C sub C is constant, um, the actual strain stiffness will vary with depth. So it does, you know, it is a depth variable. Uh, let's come back to where we were here, right here. So uh, then the other thing is that the vertical stress change can actually vary with depth too for two-dimensional or three-dimensional loading. So it's more like something you'll get into in the 121 class or 123. If you have a finite surface load acting over an infinite area, the stresses attenuate with depth. So the change in stress decreases as depth increases. In this class, we'll deal with one-dimensional loading. So vertical stress change stays the same throughout the layer for the problems we'll solve. So in generally, we do the integration numerically. And the way we do that is to Let's say we have a loading condition like this. You have some sand on top of some clay, and then you're adding some load to it, delta sigma v. Well, first, we're not going to we're not going to include the sand as part of our consolidation calculation. We're only interested in computing consolidation for the clay. So the first thing we'll do is just completely remove the sand and represent it with a variable called q naught, q sub o. And that Q sub O is the initial vertical effective stress at the top of the layer. Let me define it right here. All right, 
right, so the whole sand layer and water table, everything that's happening above the top of the clay, just gets lumped into this one Q naught variable, which makes the problem simpler to solve. Then what we'll do is discretize the clay layer into eight to ten sublayers. You could use as many sub you could use more sublayers if you want. In general, as you increase the number of sublayers, the numerical integration gets more accurate. Um, but usually we just do eight to ten if we're going to solve it using a program like Excel, because the solution tends to be pretty accurate doing it that way. And then we need to know the stress history. So that would be what is sigma v naught prime as a function of depth. You know, this is this is q naught right here, right? Q naught is the uh, effective stress right at the top of the layer. Then importantly, what is sigma p prime? And the maximum pass pressure might vary with depth. Right? It might be constant, but it might also change with depth for reasons that we'll talk about later in this lecture. And then we have to know the final vertical effective stress, which is shown by the green line. And the sigma v naught prime and sigma vf prime are parallel in this case. Yeah, well, maybe I didn't draw them quite parallel. They should be parallel because delta sigma v is a constant number. Maybe I'll sketch it in here. And that horizontal distance is delta sigma. Uh, okay, so once we've got this idea, what we can do is set up an Excel spreadsheet. And let me walk you through this sheet. This is something you'll have to kind of do on your own, but it should be fairly straightforward for you to do this. Um, I've divided my sheet into two regions. To the left of this line are all of the inputs. So these are all numbers that we have to know ahead of time in order to do the calculation. And to the right are all the things that we calculate using consolidation theory. Uh, now, some of these inputs might have to be calculated, like vertical effective stress, vertical final vertical effective stress, initial vertical effective stress, and so forth. Um, but they're inputs, and then we have to pre-calculate them as part of an, a pre-processing routine. So the inputs that I have up on top, Q0, that's the initial vertical effective stress at the top of the clay, and then delta sigma V, that's the loading that's being imposed in addition to the initial effective stress. Now I've divided this into eight sublayers. You can see there I've got rows five through twelve, and then I have the depth to the center of each sublayer here. And what I've done is discretize them into one meter thick sublayers. So the top of the clay would be at a depth of three meters, and the bottom of the clay would be at a depth of eleven meters. So it's an eight meter thick layer with eight one meter thick sublayers. I'm assuming that the sand above the clay. Uh, it has a thickness of 3 meters, and that's what's giving us the uh, 50 kPa of vertical effective stress there. Um, all right, then we have the thickness of each sublayer, which is 1 meter. Here's the vertical effective stress as we go down. And what I've assumed here is that the clay is below the water table, and that the unit weight of the clay is 6 kilonewtons per meter cubed. So I can draw that in here. Gamma. Uh, gamma total is equal to 16 kilonewtons per meter cubed. Uh, that means that gamma prime, the buoyant unit weight, is 6 kilonewtons per meter cubed. And you'll have to know the soil unit weight in order to calculate vertical effective stress. So you'll see that uh, over this half meter thickness from a depth of 3 down to 3.5, we've uh, got just 3 kPa of um, you know, half of a meter times 6 kilonewtons per meter cubed is 3 kPa. And then you'll see that each interval below is one full meter, so we're getting an increment of 6 kPa each time you go down. Sigma V naught prime is simply equal to sigma V naught prime plus delta sigma V. So I'm using a hard reference there for the 100 kPa. And then for this particular clay, I'm assuming C sub C is the same for the whole clay layer. So maybe sometimes we have uniform clay layers, sometimes we'll have multiple different clays, and we might have to run consolidation tests on all of those clays, and you might get different C sub C and C sub R values for them. But in this case, it's the same. So C C is 0.5 and C sub R is 0.05. And then I'm assuming that the initial void ratio is all equal to 2. Um, so you know maybe you measure water content, you can get these initial void ratios. And then I'm also assuming that the initial sigma p prime value is 160 kPa. And what I mean by initial sigma p prime is that that's the maximum pass pressure that exists in the ground right now before we apply any loading condition to the soil. 
uh, after we apply that 100 kPa, it's possible that we will go beyond that maximum pass pressure to a new maximum pass pressure. So what I like to do is always put another column, final sigma p prime. It turns out that we don't use this column in this calculation, but if we were to now uh, want to load the soil further or um, unload the soil or do anything to it, you know, after it's already consolidated under this 100 kPa of applied load. These are the new sigma p primes that we would use as a reference for that further loading condition. So it's always a good idea to compute these just so we remember sigma p primes a variable, not a material constant. All right, delta E is a complicated thing to calculate. Um, well, it's not that complicated. It's not too difficult. So let's walk down here to this little figure, and I'll show you. over that. Okay, here we go. So, um, I wish I could hand it over this way, but it won't do that. So, anyway, we've got three possible loading conditions here. Um, one of them is shown in green, and we're going, let's see, in all cases, we're going from sigma V naught prime here to sigma V F prime there. And uh, load case one starts at sigma V naught prime and goes all the way along the normal consolidation line to sigma V F prime. So sigma, this one was on the normal consolidation line to start, which means that it was normally consolidated, therefore sigma V naught prime was equal to sigma P prime. Um, so these three load stages would all have initially different sigma P primes. So this is symbolic. It doesn't correspond exactly to what's up here in this table. But anyway, load case one is a normally consolidated load stage. In that case, delta E is equal to C sub C times log of sigma VF prime over sigma V naught prime. Um, basically, this is just a linear equation, right? We're starting here, and then C sub C times the logarithm of sigma VF prime minus the logarithm of sigma V naught prime is equal to the, the vertical change between those two points. Of course, the difference in logs is equal to the log of the ratios, so that's why I represent it as a ratio here. Uh, okay, now, here's load case two. We start over consolidated, and we load right back to where we just touch the uh, normal consolidation line, but um, we don't actually turn the corner and start going down the normal consolidation line. So in that case, sigma V prime is equal to sigma p prime, actually. Let me uh, put a less than or equal sign there. And that puts us in load case two, where um, the change in void ratio is simply equal to c sub r times the log of sigma vf prime over sigma v naught prime. Okay, so those two load cases are simple. Load case three is a little more complicated. That's where we go part of the way um, along the c sub r line as a reloading stage, then we reach the maximum pass pressure, turn the corner, and do the rest of the stage along the C sub C line, or along the normal consolidation line. This one requires now um, a little bit of a more complicated equation. We start out going here, so from sigma V naught prime to sigma P prime, we're going along C sub R. So delta E is equal to C sub R times log of sigma P prime over sigma V naught prime. That's the change in void ratio along that line. Plus C sub C times log of sigma V F prime divided by sigma P prime. So that's the change in void ratio along that part of the line down there. Um, okay, so now we've got our equation. Uh, we're, I'm gonna use nested if statements in here. Nested if statements are pretty cool, so I'll show you that in just a second. Then we have to go on and compute the, um, the vertical strain. And the vertical strain is simply delta E over one plus E naught, which we've already established before. And then we have to compute the change in height of each sublayer, and that's simply equal to the vertical strain times the layer thickness over here. Um, so we've got all these changes in heights of each sublayer. Now all we have to do is add them all together, and we get this settlement value here. In this case, it's uh, 0 0.096 meters, 9.6 centimeters. If this was a building, that would probably be too much settlement, right? It would cause the building to have some damage. All right, now I do have some equations to show you what I'm doing in these calculation regions down here. So first of all, the final maximum.
maximum pass pressure is equal to the maximum of the initial maximum pass pressure and the final vertical effective stress. So basically, if you do turn this corner and load to a higher maximum pass pressure, you have to update this. So our first load stage is only going from 53 to 153. Maximum pass pressure is 160. So the final maximum pass pressure is also 160 because we didn't reach the final the previous maximum pass pressure. If we look down here at the bottom one, though, right now we're starting with sigma V naught prime equals 95, and we're going all the way up to 195. So now we have turned this corner and gone down the normal consolidation line a little bit, and so our new maximum pass pressure is 195. Uh, okay, now for the delta E, here's the nested if statement. So you've probably all used if statements in Excel before, equals if some condition is met, then do this thing, otherwise do this thing. Um, so what we do in a nested if statement is replace the conditional, you know, so if this thing is not true, we evaluate another if statement. So that's a way of doing like three different conditions in a single if statement. So here I've got if D5 is equal to I5, so that's um, sigma V naught prime is equal to sigma P prime, then we do F5 times log of E5 over D5. So C sub C times log of sigma VF prime over sigma V naught prime. And then if E5 is, and I'm going to put a uh, less than or equal here, less than or equal to I5. So if uh, sigma VF prime is less than or equal to the initial um, sigma P prime, then we go uh, C sub R times the log of sigma VF prime over sigma V naught prime. Otherwise, if neither of these conditions is met, we do this one, which is uh, load case 3 right here. All right, and then L5 is epsilon V, which is delta E over 1 plus E naught. M5 is epsilon V times A, the sub-layer thickness. And then consolidation settlement, S sub C, is the sum M5 to M12. Now, I want to go back to this idea that sigma p prime might vary with depth. Sorry, the initial sigma p prime might vary with depth. What I want to do is show you some real profiles of soil uh, to give you a sense for how sigma p prime might vary with depth for different conditions. So these are marine clay layers in uh, the Boston area. And what we see is that uh, sigma p prime tends to be kind of higher um, Turn on my laser. Here we go. Laser pointer. Cool. Got it. Okay, so we have a higher sigma p prime up here. So the soil is over consolidated, right? Sigma p prime is high, sigma v prime is low, therefore the OCR is high. And then it comes down, and eventually the two lines kind of meet up. So now here the clay is normally consolidated. And what tends to happen uh, in these cases is you get groundwater fluctuation, and if the groundwater comes all the way down here, the soil might become a little bit dried up, so you get this desiccated crust, and the drying up of the clay makes it have really high effective stress, so you can get a lot of over consolidation that way. Uh, all right, and then I wanted to show you this one too. This one has three distinct clay layers, probably different geologies. You know, they were deposited in different environments. So here's a clay layer where sigma p prime is up there, and then there's a sudden jump. So you might not want to fit like a line through all this, you have to recognize these are different strata, right? This is one type of clay, this is another type of clay. You probably also have different C sub C, C sub R, so that's where you might have variation in depth with all those. But you have three distinct regions for sigma P prime there. So it can be important to make a lot of consolidation test measurements if you want to accurately integrate all that strain. 